I'm Nathan Simmons, and the hotter and wetter you get, the more you can do. It's great. <laughs> and I'm Dustin Goes to Hollywood, and you know the schedule. First we dine, and then I fuck your sister. <laughs> and this is the Spooky Linings playlist, a podcast that tries to find the silver lining of some of cinema's spookiest endings. And uh, you're, you're not hearing a third voice, because I think Mally got shunted. I think he got shunted? Yeah. I have, Or, you know what? I, I did see him in the woods yesterday with his throat slit, but sure. then he showed up to the debate stage today in the gym gymnasium so i don't know i don't know what's going on there so wacky i don't know this is we gotta get to the bottom of this <laughs> welcome everyone to another entry into the spooky lightings for this month of october this holy month <laughs> nathan i am i am so excited yeah because i have never seen the movie we're talking about today society until we were going to do an episode on it uh-huh but i had I had heard so much about this movie. Yeah. And of course, particularly the third act of this movie. Absolutely. The reason for the season. <laughs> exactly. And I put it all, I put off watching it mm. until, because I knew it was going to be on the season uh, this time. And I, I put off watching it until now. And boy, <laughs> I've got some thoughts. Oh, yeah. I've got some thoughts on this movie. It's I think- so weird because I was about to ask, was, did it not disappoint? But then I'm like, I, I think you can't put a, a word to how this movie plays, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, I say this as someone who quite enjoys this movie, mm-hmm. but I would never in a million years be like, this is exactly what I thought it was going to be. Right. This is, it, it is a movie that baffles me on every viewing. I was expecting a much more a kind of Videodrome yeah. or The Brood. Like, I was expecting Cronenberg, and I definitely get it in that third act. Oh, yeah. But the first Mm, hour of this movie i feel is a- equivalent to chopping mall like, oh my gosh is, that's a great comparison it is nonsensical yeah it is confusing <laughs> it is meandering but this is right in the lane of what i appreciate about 80s movies yeah because it's so compelling at the same time <laughs> sure yeah this movie comes out in 89 in the uk uh-huh. and then premieres in the states in 92 essentially dumped right it is on the cusp on the way out yeah. of 80s cheesy slasher horror movies. And this is not a slasher. Right. There's only two deaths in this movie, but it has that same vibe. And I had a blast with this movie. Awesome. I was sleep deprived watching it, I should say. <laughs> I only had about four to five hours of full uh, like REM sleep the night before. Mm-hmm. But I watched this movie with a lemon drop because <laughs> I still had some leftover from The Exorcist 3 sure. and a bunch of candy corn oh and I passed God. it on the couch the second the credits rolled and I had a good time. Let me tell you, <laughs> I this, is, this was my second watch and the first time that I watched this movie... <laughs> was election night 2020 <laughs> oh boy oh boy man i so i i wrote a note down uh-huh. and this is my you know, i always try to come up with even if it's my first time seeing it what's my relationship with this movie have i heard of it before do yeah. i know certain aspects of it my first note on society was i just can't help but see people like trump yeah and musk yeah and bezos and zuckerberg and all these people that are just exactly like these elite characters in this movie well and that's the wild thing is i think in some spots of this movie the satire actually works yes <laughs> and it's and it's so funny because i, I and uh, correct me if i'm wrong i think this is your second brian yesna film right because it is. you've seen you've seen bride of reanimator that is exactly what i wrote down because my first note about the actual movie was i don't know if i'm a huge fan of brian yesna fair enough but I've only ever seen Bride of Reanimator in this movie. I haven't seen his Return of the Living Dead or The Dentist or any of that stuff. Well, his Return of the Living Dead movie is interesting because it's the least comical of those. Mm. And I, I think there's some great makeup effects in that one. But the uh, 
Yeah, I I, I kind of tend to groove to Brian Yosna's deal. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I think he makes, I don't know how to describe, like, smart moron movies. I don't know if that makes uh, sense. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think he's got some cool ideas. Yeah. I just don't know if I always vibe with the tone of his movies. Well, and that's, so that's the thing about Bride of Reanimator is, like, for the first hour, it's a remake of Reanimator. <laughs> yes, it and is. And then <laughs> the last 20 minutes is, let's let Screamin' Mad George do whatever the fuck he wants. Right. And on top of that i really miss when motherfuckers named screaming mad george got to work on movies <laughs> mm-hmm. the closest i can think of is you get somebody like junkie xl to make the score for a movie sure. <laughs> but yeah. what i was gonna say about like the elitist characters in this movie like mm-hmm. when ted ferguson says the rich have always sucked on low-class shit like you i'm like sure. that just sounds like something trump jr has said before in his life oh yeah like <laughs> and it, and like fully not as a joke not as a not bit. as a joke at all and, and, and in fact the phrasing is we've always sucked off yes. low class shit like you which yes. I'm like you're so close to like making this a slam but uh-huh. it sounds like you're just sucking them off and it, it just I feel like it's the same problem I had watching Succession which mm. I thought was a great show but I'm like a lot of parallels here yeah every <laughs> single one of these characters need to be hurled into the sun I yeah. just can't it's too close to the to home and I just ugh. it's honestly surprising that that show didn't end with the shunting I know <laughs> If that show would have ended with a shot, take, I, 10 out of 10, maybe my favorite <laughs> series of all time. Just just imagining like Kendall Roy mm. and Roman Roy just merging together as one. <laughs> Their lips contorting together. Or or, or Tom. God, Tom would be <laughs> the, the judge of this character of this movie. Like ugh. the thing about this movie, like you, I I unfortunately had the ending sort of spoiled for me. Like yeah. I knew I didn't know to what extent everything gets to, but I'd seen, you know, I'd seen screenshots. I knew about the butt head gag. Mm-hmm. I knew about I'd seen like that wide shot of what I like to call the flesh carnival. <laughs> <laughs> that is just like where the you know the creepy calliope music really goes into play mm-hmm. but yeah i i didn't i like you also i did was not prepared for the dreamlike first hour of this movie right and i have a theory about this okay i think once the script was written Brian Yosna went through it and removed every other line. <laughs> he, he Christopher Walken his fucking screenplay. <laughs> yes. He just went in and started removing stuff. Well, it's just like the none of the con- none of the conversations connect, right? Yeah. Like at one point the dad says, uh, you're looking at the next student body president. And the mom's response is, we're so excited for our party next week. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, there's also when in the beginning of the movie, when, uh, I, th- I think the dad is like, by the way, was that Milo I saw outside? Oh, and yeah. then Billy starts answering and he just, right. In mid sentence, he turns around and starts walking away, walks away. <laughs> there's uh, he has that conversation with Clarissa where, uh, he asks her about her mom. He's like, what's her deal? And she goes, she does things I don't like. And his response is, I've never met anyone like you. <laughs> and then the scene's over. <laughs> it's just so. Yeah, I got, I think most of my knows are questions about Clarissa's mom. Oh, I, <laughs> I just did. I did. Yeah. I mean, we could, we could talk for hours about Clarissa's mom. Absolutely. So I'll say this. If you're f- tuning in for the first time oh, yeah. to our show, welcome. You have stumbled upon. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> a conversation I am expecting to have here. Um, we are a show that likes to watch movies such as society that don't always end on happily ever after endings. Mm-hmm. And we discuss them. And then at the end of the show, we'd like to give our silver linings for the characters at the end there. And society is a first time watch for me. Nathan, how many times do you think you've seen this movie? At least twice? Two and a half. Yeah. Two and a half? Okay. Because <laughs> I, I always come right when the shunting starts and then I'm like, <laughs> then I go to bed. Yeah, and you feel the shame and I embarrassment. And you're like, why am I doing this? Post society um, clarity. That's the thing. Like, I had I had known about the shunting, and mm-hmm. I wish I hadn't because, like I said before, this movie feels very um, unimportant. Yeah. Up until that moment, like in terms of film history, this film is like another movie cashing in on the '80s cheese of paranoia thrillers, slashers, things like that. Mm-hmm. But then when the shunting happens, it's just like. Okay, this is playing by its own rules. This is why I'm here. This is this is why I bought a ticket. Yes, right, here. right. Which is sort of the screaming Mad George promise, right? Mm-hmm. Like I, I recently rewatched the Dream Master, mm-hmm. and that movie is mostly unremarkable except for some of the best effects in the Nightmare on Elm Street series. I was going to say this movie has a strong connection to what we're talking about next week. Mm-hmm. So, like knowing what is coming down the pipeline for our show, watching this movie, I was like, oh, this movie starts, and I'm already getting vibes of what we're 
we're talking about next week. Like I'm yeah. already feeling the same thing. And then to find out that the same special effects artist that worked on the makeup and stuff for this movie also worked on the next movie. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. I see the parallels for sure. Totally. So let's say this. If you've never seen Society, how would we briefly sum up? Like, what's the <laughs> log line for this movie? I, I think it would be a Beverly Hills high school student is paranoid that his relatives are not who they think they are. Uh-huh. And... Something is out to get him, but he doesn't know what or why. Yeah. I think that would be the most baseline logline I could come up with. And he finds out, yeah, that his family's up to some really gross stuff, but he can't prove it. Mm -hmm. He's being gaslit by an entire town, essentially. Right, right. Yeah, this movie reminded me of another movie. I just could not put my finger on what it is. But I will say, and I think I've talked about this movie a couple of times this season already, (laughs) but if you haven't seen the latest A24 horror installment, talk to me. There is a scene is very quick in that movie that is very similar to the shunting in this movie mm. and it's scary as hell it comes out of nowhere i still need to watch that yeah it is it is disturbing and it's the best scene of that movie i think wow in terms of like the thesis statement of that movie but i highly recommend it if you haven't seen it already it's one of the best movies of the year for me but yeah if you're if you're digging the shunting and i guess <laughs> Do we save it to the end when we're actually talking about the movie to describe for those who don't know what the shunting is? I think that makes sense. Yeah, I guess what we can say is the, this movie's most famous for a gore-tastic, weird, special effects-laden sequence in which... Uh, a whole bunch of people sort of have a mutated flesh orgy. Yeah, that's... Yeah, I can't I can't describe it any better than that. I mean, I truly like my uh my my girlfriend was asking me what movie we were watching this week and then asked me like what's that about and I said, "You know what? We'll we'll just watch it sometime because I like <laughs> I can't it's impossible to really describe this film." And, and it's an enigma because like I said, it is a movie where the first hour or so is pretty unremarkable, uh-huh. but it's entertaining in its own way. But yes. it's a very different film. I yeah. I cannot wait for the inevitable. How did this get made? Or we hate movies episode of this movie because I, I just <laughs> can't believe they haven't done it. Yeah, I need to hear some of those people describe <laughs> the the shunting. I feel but, like I feel like the I hate movies guys would have as much fun with the shunting as they had with Intergang in uh-huh. Black Adam. <laughs> uh-huh. I just. The sh- the shunting cannot be overstated if you've never seen it. You can you can go on YouTube and watch it. It's amazing <laughs> that the scenes are still up on YouTube. It but is it like ma- like uh, Nathan said. It is just an amalgamation of body horror yeah. and like a Cthulhu esque. Sure. <laughs> like I, I I don't know. It's it's a lot. And we are playing with some of that unknowable ancient evil, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's mm-hmm. all these implications throughout the movie that yeah, these aren't aliens. These are just another race of being that's been around as long as humans have you know what it's like it's like in that thing prequel from 2011 uh-huh. when the guy from not another team movie i can't remember his name <laughs> but he he merges with that swedish guy like oh, yeah their faces contort and literally absorb one another to become a monster that's the shunting basically but like essentially multiply that by 10 put some giallo lighting and some uh ky jelly all over <laughs> yeah and also everyone's enjoying it mm-hmm. like it's it's like a sexy time it's version <laughs> of that we'll, we'll break it down further when we actually get into the the synopsis of the movie yeah. and everything but why don't we talk about uh the release and the creation the cast all the good stuff about 1989 slash 1992's society of which we live in i should mention like this is the joker's perfect world we, we do live in society <laughs> So, like I said, the movie was released in the UK in 1989, but didn't have a United States release until 1992. Uh-huh. Uh, the director, as we mentioned, is also Brian Yuzna, who you may know from producing the Reanimator movies before directing uh, Bride Reanimator. He's done the Dentist movies, Sleep, uh, not Sleepaway Camp, um, uh, Slumber Party Massacre sequels, The Dentist, and things like that. Did he? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Really? I'm pretty sure. I'll look it up just to confirm, but I'm pretty sure. Well, that would make sense because uh, wh- the the actress who plays Shauna is in Slumber Party Massacre 2, mm-hmm. which is a masterpiece and a half. <laughs> and, and one of the kids from this movie, uh, I can't remember his name, but the, the guy he debates, that Billy debates uh, oh, yeah, uh-huh. at the assembly, is in one of the Slumber Party Massacre movies as well. Oh, so. you're right. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not Slumber Party Massacre. It's Silent Night, Deadly 
night. Oh, yes, he did. He directed a couple of those too. Yeah. He's he the kid from the the uh debate club is the toy in uh one of these movies that's oh, like, wow. I love you, mommy. I love you, mommy. Oh, he's tra- yes. Okay. <laughs> yep. Oh boy, oh boy, man! Eighties, I, 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 what a career! I know the eighties and nineties are known for like having some weird movies, but I don't think people people fully appreciate how weird it got. He directed a movie that was very close to to also being on the schedule this season, uh, and it's probably a stay tuned. But Faust, Love of the Damned, mm-hmm. is based on a indie comic book that is like the most try hardy, <laughs> hyper violent. What if the devil was Batman kind of thing? Oh it's, my god! It's one of the worst movies I've ever seen, and I may end up uh, making you watch it. <laughs> the gin is in it, so oh, oh like <laughs> there's the at actual, least that. the the actor uh, Adam Devoff, Andrew Devoff, Andrew Devoff. Yes, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'm, maybe for season eight. Okay. <laughs> that would be great. Uh, the movie stars Billy Warlock. Yeah. Which is a real name. And how f- unfair is it you get to grow up with a cool ass name like Billy Warlock? And like that's being, unfair. Being the son of Dick Warlock. Dick Warlock. Oh, tricky Dick Warlock. <laughs> <laughs> which Billy Warlock, if you're, if you're not familiar with that name, you may have seen him yeah. because he is the kid with the boom box in 1981's Halloween two that bumps into michael myers that was his film debut and michael myers played by his daddy exactly and his dad dick warlock played michael myers in that movie so it's it's a nice little uh you know on screen your first debut totally you know what i mean uh dick warlock also previously seen on this podcast in halloween three he's one of the robot assassins mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. he sure is <laughs> and i just love saying his name <laughs> we're, we are gonna do halloween two at some point i've yeah. decided we're gonna do it so we'll make it work this movie also stars a dev Evan uh, DeVasquez, Evan Richards, and Ben Meyerson. The budget was a meager $2 million, uh, and it only managed to gross a $1 million worldwide, and most of that was coming from home media sales. Wow. And the movie currently sits at what may be justified a 62% on Rotten Tomatoes. I feel like that's fair. Yeah. You know? 62% 62% seems accurate. I, I do love that Yuzna's, like, reason for why the movie failed is he's, he's like, in Europe, they, like, they hate the rich. Right. <laughs> in the U.S., it's, <laughs> the U.S. people were just like, what is this? We idolize the rich here, for uh-huh. sure. And before we get into the trailer, which I haven't seen yet, and I'm eager to see, uh-huh. why why in particular society right now, Nathan? What what drew you to put this one on the schedule this week? Um, well, so it was it was one that I I just bought on Blu-ray. I was really excited to to track that down because it's it's kind of sort of out of print, I think, right now, but. Mm. Uh, uh, also, it was one that I'd been wanting to revisit, and as I was thinking about it, I just I just realized, one, it would be perfect for this show because it has such an abrupt ending. It sure does. <laughs> and two, I, I knew you hadn't watched it, but were curious about it, mm-hmm. and I knew that Mally would be, would have so many questions for me. <laughs> <laughs> Which we should say, even though Mally is unfortunately not here with us today, he did text us and say his... Uh, his thoughts on the movie were uh, Nathan, what the fuck? Yeah, which is which is fair. Um, and <laughs> that's, I that's apt. And I, you know, I do think that in the last uh, the last year, the last few years, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of debate about the you know the the elite and how people are being kind of crushed down in America mm-hmm. and you know tech bros uh, taking over our social media platforms mm-hmm. and um, I don't know. It's just it's a movie I've been thinking about a lot lately, and I thought uh, it would it make for a hell of a conversation. Well, it is interesting. Because even though I don't know if Brian Usna intended to put this stuff in there, but this is like I said at the end of the eighties, mm-hmm. like we're kind of moving beyond the the slasher uh, genre. And again, this isn't a slasher necessarily, but it does definitely, definitely has those vibes, right? And this is post Reaganomics, post Wall Street, like yeah. the celebration of of opulence. Yeah, I was thinking about this last night too. I'm like, why did we have such an obsession with slashers in the eighties? Right. And I think the the thing that I came to was. I think it's a lot of post Vietnam. Mm. I think it's a lot of post oil crisis. It's right on the cusp of the Cold War. Right. And I think what we were just obsessed with was from the audience perspective, a lot of these people were either just getting back from Vietnam and having that experience, uh-huh. or they were, their children were coming of age and, um, 
you know, Halloween had been such a smash smash success mm-hmm. that from the studio side, they're like, fuck it. Let's just put out cheap horror movies <laughs> that will get people in the seats. Yeah. People love boobs. Let's yeah. get some boobs in there, too. <laughs> this is what the kids want. Well, it was it was the next step up from the Corman, right. you know, B movies of the 50s and 60s. Right, right. Because they're not interested. The kids aren't interested in Bullet anymore. They're not interested <laughs> in Dirty Harry. They want to see boobs on screen. They want to sure. see special effects, gore, and stuff like that. And like I said, I think that was all the response from Vietnam for the most part. But then, like I said, this is on the way out. Right. And this is where we start to really get into like, well, what does this stuff all kind of mean? Right. And I don't know if Brian Usner was is actively putting these themes and these ideas in this movie, but I think subconsciously he's doing it. Yeah. Like, I think the elitist, uh, you know, these, these, these high-level characters literally feasting off the poor yeah. is... Like, is transparent. I think that he intended for that stuff to be in there. But I feel like there's a lot of other things in this movie that subconsciously he was putting in there and didn't know why. Oh, I, I think, well, there's there's some really fun interviews with him on the Blu-ray where he talks about how everything was sort of reverse engineered from the effects. Sure. You know, he, he's like, I, I had this nightmare of, like, the undulating flesh, and that's kind of where the script started. Mm-hmm. And then I wanted to do, like, a paranoia thriller and sort of reverse engineered a lot of th- scenes to lead into effects and sometimes it didn't really connect in a logical way yeah. and then he's like so then i would rework the scenes to work on dream logic yeah. and i think that's why the movie has the, this kind of tone but i also think uh it's impossible to ignore that this was being developed you know uh, coming out of the aids crisis as well oh 100 and this is a you know a movie about the you know the the terror of you know promiscuous sex mm-hmm. and and the, the the taboos that are being violated by the by the elite as well i mean he he talks about it the interview he's like the you know the ultimate thing that you just couldn't do on you know in films or tell in stories is incest and he's like so obviously that had to be like the main thing i talk about sure in this movie. sure no and and being inspired by like just salvador dali surrealism oh, yeah. like that's a big aspect of uh of this movie especially when it comes to the shunting and everything like that but oh i mean there's this great uh interview with screaming mad george where he talks about how he was a he was an art student in new york studying surrealist art and he was like but i felt super unfulfilled by my paintings and he's like and then i watched the howling yep. and american werewolf in london yep. and altered states and i realized oh it's because my paintings can't move yeah so that's how you get like these wild images right you need that three-dimensional aspect of like bringing these creations to life and this is this this movie if if the movie itself is unremarkable like I, like we've talked about before the special effects work is Top otherworldly notch. like it is very lovecraftian uh-huh. and it invokes such a disturbing sense of all the senses like yeah. i i feel like i can know exactly what that room smells like during the shunting <laughs> oh, i know exactly yeah, right. what it feels like that's why i always go to bat for bride of reanimator sure. is like that that last 20 minutes in the tombs i think is just like a playground of insanity yeah i wish i wish that movie expanded on that part of it more but i agree yeah all right well let's watch the trailer before we do this movie had the perfect drop that I had to pull because <laughs> it's exactly how I feel about you, Nathan. I think you'll appreciate this, but Aww. this is what I wanted to say to you. Mean machine, Jelly Bean. <laughs> so, <laughs> I wrote that down. <laughs> Let's watch the trailer for 1989 Society. For Bill Whitney. I've never been paranoid. Fear plays a large part in family life. It's a <laughs> very uninspired like VO work. Yeah. And if I scratch the surface, there'll be something terrible underneath. He's afraid his sister... Could you zip me up, Billy? ...is not what she seems. God, Bill, what's the matter with you? Wow, what a shot to put in the he trailer in the eighties. Yeah. ...are out to get him. You make waves, with me. you're gonna drown. <laughs> People are what they are. <laughs> very, no, very psychological to thing to say. Worst yeah. therapist I've seen in a movie in a long time. <laughs> find yeah. Out the truth. <laughs> so why, why are you guys doing this to me, huh? Boy, you've been living with these people all your life and you didn't know anything about this? Is far worse than he could ever imagine. <laughs> if you don't follow the rules, Billy, bad things happen. Didn't you know the Billy Boy? The rich have all sucked off low-class scum <laughs> like you. Oh, guy. Clarissa? Don't be so intense. People now, keep holding this kid's face. I know. Follow the 
minds. It's a question of what you're born to. You never were one of us. Yeah, I, like, how do you sell this movie when you can't show the shunting? Yeah, a paranoid thriller, I guess, which is what this trailer's trying. Can't you see they're setting you up for something? You know how I hate to give you drugs. Okay, we I, we got to talk about that scene, like the uh-huh. the the protracted. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, 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 no. Oh, God. Oh, man. <laughs> With society. Who are you? Let me give you a hand, Bill. Oh, my God. <laughs> Great effect. In Beverly Hills, what you fear is only the beginning. What does that mean? I, I, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Great trailer besides the VO, though, I think. Right, yeah. No, I... Okay. I got a lot of thoughts right off the bat about Mm. Billy Warlock. Okay. I think, just on his look alone, (laughs) two notes. Yeah. One, we got to bring back the mullet. Absolutely. Like, his kind of mullet, specifically. Like, it's a good look. The Uncle Jesse mullet. I was going to say, my second note is, Billy Warlock looks like if you took a young Jared Leto and a pre-Full House John Stamos and (laughs) smashed their heads together. Sure. (laughs) Shunted them, if you will. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. He's he's a good-looking kid. I think he's doing pretty good work in this movie, even if the, the rest of the cast around him is less than stellar i also think he's left adrift by some of the the scenes not really connecting or making a whole lot of sense yeah i i that's that's my biggest problem with this movie is i don't think all of the tones work collectively right like it's a paranoid thriller but it also has like this dream logic like you said in some of the scenes and then it's also trying to be this this horror movie this body horror movie and i just feel like the tone is kind of all over the place oh it's also clear to me that like this is brian yosna's first film oh, as a yeah. director because yeah. like he, he, which is so funny because like reanimator was such a profitable hit mm-hmm. that he was able to leverage making a sequel to reanimator he's like but you gotta let me make this society movie first right this is part of a two-picture deal yeah but you can tell like some at i think the performers in this movie are just bringing what they have to it right like sure. i don't i don't know that they're getting a ton of direction yeah. because i i can tell like he's really focused on the effects which as he should be yeah he's focused on the effects he's focusing focusing on connecting everything right but i like i said i think this is like like you mentioned this is just a first time director really getting his bearings but we have this actor who played like especially the actor who plays blanchard oh, uh, tim bartell who i kept thinking was Francis from Pee Wee's Big Adventure. <laughs> um, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, he's giving like like Shakespearean performance in uh-huh. some parts of this movie. Like, it, and I read uh, this thing in the the IMDb trivia where apparently he had they had to keep they had to edit around him during the shunting because his performance was too upsetting. And that's why they added the the classical score yeah. over it, just because they like it's. Too, and I'm like, no, nah, man. Drive further into that direction. Get rid of the score. Let him fucking play. Because he is terrified during the shunting. Yeah. Like, it, it's what sells that scene. Like, the effects are good. Yeah. But they can't come off as a little goofy, especially when we eventually talk about Ted Ferguson getting <laughs> out of here, the picture. But yeah, the tone is like all over the place here. Yeah. And, and I feel like that kid gives a great performance. Yeah. Maybe the best performance of the movie. I agree. Okay. So, this movie starts and it's a dream sequence. Sure. And it is... If if you've seen the first Nightmare on Elm Street, I would say it's got a lot of that kind of feeling to it. It almost feels like Johnny Depp's character in that movie just kind of walking around this <laughs> empty mansion. There's there's uh, some ethereal music playing and everything. Another character that has like a loose kitchen knife in a drawer. Mm-hmm. A loose kitchen knife in a drawer that he then cradles in the palm <laughs> yeah. of his hand, like grips Holds it. Holds the blade. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that's about. Uh, but he wakes up from this dream and he is uh, talking to his therapist. His therapist that gives... Almost a Wall of Shawn yeah. kind of performance in this movie. Yeah. I got a question. What the fuck is this? What is going on with this apple that I did not even realize was an apple at first right. until later on in the movie where he eats another one and it's a, the color of an apple. But this is like a... Uh, it looks like a pear, right? It does look like a pear, but then when he bites into it, it's clearly the sound of an apple. Uh-huh. And I'm just like, this fruit looks fucking terrible. I don't know why you would ever eat this. Even before <laughs> you see that there are 5,000 worms inside of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and he doesn't really react too much. He's just like, oh, well, that's odd. So that's the <laughs> other thing is if we really want this to be a, a paranoia thriller, we need to see a little more the paranoia Mm -hmm. like there are people are nonplussed about the most insane things of all time in this movie yes he 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 bites into this apple and then looks at it and there's a bunch of worms in it and he's just like 
Well, that's odd. Yeah, I guess I, I guess I shouldn't bring this up. <laughs> yeah, I, I I forgot I bit into the worm infested apples. I should have grabbed from the other <laughs> right. pile of apples. No, we zoom instead. We zoom into his eye, mm-hmm. and then we get the opening titles, the opening credits that. Look like because you at this point it's giving you a preview of the shunting, uh-huh. but it's in shadows. It's hard to make out exactly what's happening. It looks like a xenomorph orgy. Sure, but that being said, the tone of these opening credits is great because it's very creepy with like this droning bass and this angelic falsetto female vocals yeah. over it. It's pretty good. What was it about the eighties that were like th- ruled by these like carnival sounding <laughs> opening title sequences? Like I this don't know. puppet master. The Shining does it. <laughs> oh yeah. If you listen to the opening of The Shining, it's got like some droning, like weird sound effects and plus the tuba and everything like right. that. So and maybe the coolest credit of all time oh. that pops up during these opening credits, Surrealist Makeup Effects by Screaming Mad George. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I was not familiar, I'll be honest, with, with the, I had heard the name Screaming Mad George before, but I was not familiar with his work. And then I looked up his credits. I'm like, oh, he also did makeup effects for the movie we're talking about next week. That makes sense. Does he do the, that one or does he do the one after that? Because I he, thought he, he... I think he does both. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure he does both. Screaming Mad George is a uh, Japanese uh, immigrant to this country yeah. that, like, like you mentioned, went to school for uh, surrealist expressionism and ended up becoming a very uh, prolific in uh, indie and low budget uh, 80s and 90s horror movies, making yeah. some of the wildest special effects you've ever seen he's a he's a genius absolutely uh, yeah you're right he does do the next one yes he, he, i mean he got his start in big trouble in little china mm-hmm. he did work on predator mm-hmm. he directed a movie that myself and uh past and future guest jt kelly love the mm. guyver mm. based on the uh the anime <laughs> never seen it <laughs> very silly what if power rangers was rated r oh okay he also worked on the abyss yes yeah 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 so there you go yeah, it's great, great special effects. No, uh, an absolute genius. Also uh, worked on, you know, music. He he, cr- he designed masks for Slipknot. Mm-hmm. He put out three metal albums. One of his music videos is on the Blu-ray for Society, and it's a trip. Oof. Yeah, no, th- th- he he's done a lot of fantastic work. Yeah. and very uh, inspired. You know, not not unlike a Rick Baker or a Tom Savini or something like that. So oh, yeah, Rob Botin, I yeah, think, is like yeah. really similar to his stuff too. Yeah, yeah, just genius. So this movie starts after the opening credits with uh, Billy and his friend Milo playing <laughs> basketball in the front in his the front yard of his Beverly Hills mansion with some sitcom ass acting. Well, I was gonna say <laughs> in dialogue the outfits these guys are wearing. Oh, I know. I I have been known i am famous on this podcast <laughs> for enjoying short shorts little shorts but these basketball shorts on billy are even too short for me this is underwear this guy is wearing. billy's <laughs> wardrobe is puzzling in this movie because he loves short shorts mm-hmm. but the biggest fucking shirts i've seen in my life short sleeve t-shirts with sleeves past the elbow it's <laughs> Yeah. It is. He's wearing a nightgown and then the shortest of shorts through most of this movie. <laughs> okay, here's the question I have too. I yeah. mean, this is a little premature to talk about, but I don't get the character of Billy in terms of where he stands in the world of this movie. Like, he's clearly rich. Right. He is clearly athletic. So you think he would be a jock, which if you're watching you think an he'd 80s, be popular. I was going to say, which you, if you know 80s movies, you would think, oh, jock equals popular. But right. He's bullied by a bunch of bullied by people in the debate team. <laughs> Which I found right. very yeah. puzzling. Yeah, the kid who looks like fucking uh, Millhouse yes. is like one of the bullies. Yes. And I, I just didn't get it. I was like, okay, he's dating a cheerleader uh-huh. who apparently is the only cheerleader in this movie. I thought that was bizarre. She has a friend who's never named but has these dope ass earrings with mm-hmm. like Duran Duran album art on them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just, I didn't get what the social standing of Billy was supposed to be. No. But I guess that plays into the paranoia aspect of it. Right. He feels completely out of sorts with everybody. Sure. Like he doesn't even believe his parents are his parents. Right. Which is a bold scene. Yes. I, I feel like. Uh huh. So he's got this sister and his sister is getting ready for what they call her coming out party, which right. I honestly did not know what that meant and had to look it up. But yeah. Do, do those still happen? I, I mean, quinceañeras are a thing. Sure. And I think this is essentially the same thing. But this is like we're introducing a debutante to the the high society other high society people in town right and it's also incredibly uncomfortable because the mom of this movie oh sure seems to be trying to pawn off the sister to this character that we don't meet to the end of the film judge carter yeah she's just like 
uh, you should get ready. You know, Judge Carter will be there tonight. And I'm like, ew, yeah, ew, yeah, yeah. Ew, ew, this, ew. She's, <laughs> she's turning 16 and you're excited to introduce her to this 70 year old man. Bleh, bleh. And she's get, the sister's getting ready and she notices someone is in her closet. Uh, sure. Turns out it's her ex-boyfriend Blanchard who is eager just to talk to her. And you think it's, oh, this is our next boyfriend and he's just trying to get back together with her. But sure. we'll come to find out. It's much more, it's much bigger than that later on. And then, yeah, Billy's parents come home. He explains, yeah, David was in her closet. Now, they seem nonplussed, as you right. said, about it. Well, that kid's strange. Yeah, that kid's strange. And then they just kind of fuck off. And the sister asked Billy to help zip up her dress, right. but I could not get the vibe out of this out of my head from this movie because it f- essentially felt like she was saying, "Can you zip me up, step bro?" And oh, I'm like, I don't, yeah, that, I don't need that." That's 100 <laughs> percent the energy in this scene. There are some scenes in this movie between these two that is so borderline pornographic driven. Uh-huh. Like that is the nature of the scene. It is so uncomfortable. This is a bathtub. <laughs> what are you talking about? This isn't the beach. This is a bathtub. <laughs> It's the same energy. Maybe, maybe the best thing to ever come out of pornography <laughs> of all time. That is, uh, it's such a good moment. It's a bold statement. Um, <laughs> yeah, Billy, but Billy zips up her dress and her back pulses, and it looks like the like this effect reminded me of you know that scene in the room mm. where Lisa's neck does that weird thing. Yes. See, I was gonna say that's what it looks like. I was gonna say it reminds me of the scarabs in the mummy. Oh, like, sure, <laughs> sure. Under the skin. But yeah, Billy is like, oh, your your back is damp and she goes well i did just get out of the shower and i was like oh okay that makes sense but i think doesn't she say i'm not taking another shower that's right she goes well i'm not gonna take another shower you're right <laughs> which like doesn't make sense as a response no. and this kid like billy keeps seeing these things and then just doesn't tell anybody well, or, he, or he tries to and then the classic switcheroo that we'll talk about later on oh, yeah, happens of course yeah and we cut to this packed debate yes uh, yes scene which i guess is happening the same night that he also has a game <laughs> i guess, so that's the thing does he play on the basketball team he did say he's like i got a game tonight otherwise i'd be there for your coming out party oh okay 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 because and then and then he'd go then the next scene is the debate and then after that he goes to his therapist and he's like we won the game and the debate yeah so okay so billy is somehow this rich kid uh-huh that plays on the basketball team that is running for class president, but is also a part of the debate team, right. of which his class president rival is also a member of. Sure, it's I don't I don't get it. No, I don't get this character and what they want. And <laughs> like, he apparently wins the debate, but has to go do another one later. He wins the debate, but also he does it while being hypnotized <laughs> by this girl's crotch. Oh, which, sure. There, there's a lot happening in the scene. So we, we start the scene, I should mention, with a cheer from this girl who apparently is the only cheerleader at this high school. Sh- Shauna, yeah. With maybe the laziest cheer of all time, which is, we are number one. Yeah. <laughs> which I don't feel like is appropriate for a debate. Like maybe at a football game or a basketball game, that cheer makes sense. But sure. who is number one in this? Is it Billy or is it his the guy he's debating? Or the school. Or the school itself. There you go. And also, where are all the teachers? I don't think we see a single teacher in this entire movie. We don't. And no, the debate is run by his buddy Milo, which yes. seems way out of order. Oh, that, that is a conflict of interest there for sure. But also... <laughs> The, uh, the only two times we cut to this the this school, uh-huh. or I guess three, they're both in the assembly, like in the auditorium, uh-huh. and there's no teachers to be found. No. And then the third time is in a hallway where, yet again, no teachers are to be found. No, I think it's this is one of those, like, really cool, like, private schools where the, the students teach themselves. <laughs> It's a, a Stanford prison experiment where some of, teach, <laughs> some of the students are teachers, some of them are students. And then I just wrote down, Billy's really got his silly willy on his mind sure because does. during this debate, this girl in the front row just spreads her legs to distract him with her underwear. Uh-huh. And he it, she falls for it hook, line, and sinker because- she's Sharon stones him. She sure does. Because he's talking about the school dress code. He's like, yes, I think we should have a school dress code. We should follow it strictly. We should wear all the clothes. Yes. <laughs> And uh, his girlfriend, who I guess is the cheerleader uh-huh. uh, that we see, gets uh, frustrated with him. And yeah, he just like he, he manages to recover and apparently wins the debate. Yeah, I mean, we don't the scene just ends. So yeah, we don't see any kind of deliberation or anything. <laughs> right. 
Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot going on there. He wins the debate by like insulting his opponent, mm-hmm. which also felt very pointed when I watched it on election night. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's absolutely and very uh, true to form when it comes to eighties uh, high school movies. Absolutely. For sure. just insult the nerds and you got it locked in the bag. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Then we cut to Billy's house and he's gonna go upstairs to get some suntan lotion. Sure. Which happens to be in the bathroom while his sister's taking a shower. And this is yet again another scene where I'm like, I get that's the point, but there's a lot of uh, insinuations going on yeah. because his sister's in the shower and they it's got one of those frosted glass doors on it. Right. And what appears to be that he sees is He sees his sister's front butt. He sees his sister's front butt <laughs> with her boobs on her back. Uh-huh. And he's just very confused. And then instead of just leaving the room, he decides I'm going to open the shower door on my I sister's see shower this. room. Yeah. And just like in the trailer, she covers herself up. She's normal, you know, boobs on the front and butt on the back. Yep. And just goes, oh, my God, Billy, close the door. <laughs> right. And also, yeah. So what was the point? Did she do this as a prank on him? Like, I, I guess that plays into the dream nature of this movie, which is, did he really see that or is he just paranoid? Well, this is also where I wrote down, I've never seen a movie with the word squelching so much in subtitles. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And he's just like, Oh, I was just getting my suntan lotion. Uh, she goes, sorry, sorry about your front butt. Mm-hmm. Then he goes to the beach with his girlfriend, the cheerleader, uh-huh. who is still annoyed at him. And she asks him, or she, she didn't ask him, she tells him, if you really love me, you'd get us invited to Ted Ferguson's party. Mm-hmm. And to which I just wrote down in all caps, Turd Ferguson's party? <laughs> <laughs> No, this is this is where I revisited one of my notes from 365 days, which oh, is boy. that there's n- nothing sexy about the beach. Nope, not at all. I don't want anyone to rub suntan lotion on me. Nope. I don't. There's a lot of replacement cum shots in this movie. Like yes. Oh, we got to talk about that coming with up. Lotion. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, who has said it better than Anakin Skywalker? Sand is rough and coarse and gets, gets everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Why would you want to endure that? Absolutely. But. This is where it really the facial scene we gotta talk about. <laughs> so these kids sneak up on on Billy and his girlfriend Shauna as they're they're making out. They squirt a bunch of suntan lotion on them. Billy chases after them, falls in the sand. He looks up, and it's like the scene in two thousand one where the monkeys first see the monolith. There's sure. this this woman, Clarissa, the woman that was uh, crossing uncrossing her legs at the debate, uh-huh. and she's blocking out the sun. And she just takes the suntan lotion and gives him a facial with it. Yeah. Squirts it all over his face, and I'm like, what is happening in this movie? Totally wild. <laughs> and then she just fucks off. Billy cleans himself up and goes over to Ted Ferguson. And again, this is where I really just did not understand. Is Billy supposed to be a dork? Right. Is he a jock? What is he? Because they're like taunting him and laughing at him. And it's so funny when you, again, like the his debate team uh, rival, mm-hmm. uh, Martin, mm-hmm. was, is at the beach as well. Uh, Ted Ferguson seems to hang out with nerds and punks yeah. because like one of his friends is also that chick that has like Catherine O'Hara and Beetlejuice hair. Boy, <laughs> boy, we got to talk about this extra. She is all over this movie. I love you can her. spot her from a mile away. A fashion icon. Her her hair is to the heavens. Like, oh, yeah. it is, there's a lot. There's a lot going on with that girl. I wanted her movie, honestly. <laughs> Blanchard, actually, is it right here where he uh, shows up with the the, the tape? Right? Tape recording, which is one of the wildest things I've ever heard in my life. So, the ex that we saw at the beginning of the movie that was in the sister's closet shows up and says, Billy, I got to talk to you. You got to listen to this tape. Don't be mad. I bugged your guys' car. Right. And he plays back this tape, <laughs> and it's just a bunch of, yeah, like like you mentioned, squelching noises and, oh, I haven't felt this good since I came out and stuff like, like it's It sounds like an orgy happening. Well, and it's the mom and dad saying stuff like, well, we're going to have sex with you, and yes. then you'll be ready for everyone else. And But what's so funny to me is, like, some of the lines uh, sound like placeholders. Like yes. One, there's a recording of a woman saying to Jenny... Wow, your boobs are totally sexy. Yeah, guys are gonna pop high ones the second they see you. I wrote that. Now that was gonna be my other intro, which was <laughs> my boobs are totally sexy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just 
it's so funny because it's supposed to be played as oh this was uh candid this is right. caught in the moment but it's clearly just a bunch of people in this sound booth just recording their lines oh yeah every time he fast forwards it's at the very beginning of a sentence mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so billy's like what the fuck and he go he takes the tape uh-huh. he goes back to his therapist and this is the worst therapist I, like i mentioned of all time this i think he's clearly in crisis yes and he's just yelling at this he's like people are what they are which is very similar to it is what it is <laughs> right, but even before that it's well it, it is also exactly what peter the psychiatrist says in the room where mm-hmm. he says people are people yeah but the he he goes to the therapist's house at night and the guy is just like i'm trying to sleep go home yeah <laughs> and, and he's like i will listen to this tape tomorrow uh-huh. so billy leaves the tape with him and he, billy ends up going to this party anyway that ted ferguson did not invite him to as far as i know yeah but Clarissa was like, "Oh, just come to the party. You'll be my plus one or whatever." Well, before that, sure, he he re he replays the tape, yes. and all the dialogue is different. Oh, is that right here? I thought that was the next day, but you might be right. Yeah, I was gonna say it's the classic bait and switch of, oh, the tape had one thing, and then the next day the tape says something totally different. But my question is, did they all just get together to re-record the tape with slightly different dialogue? Well, that's the whole thing. Is like, is this movie really playing into the dream nature of it? Right. Is it really paranoia? I mean, it comes to find out the end everything he thought was true is true right so you're right and worse it's either one of two things like you said it's either the therapist went to the the, the family and said hey billy's on to us we got to re-record audio on this tape right. or he didn't hear what he actually heard which is nonsense yes. so i don't know <laughs> right and so billy trying to prove the point tells blanchard hey meet me in just a few minutes mm-hmm. and this is where blanchard is supposedly in an accident on his way to meet billy and right. looking at this car you would think Blanchard was a balloon full of blood. Yes. It's it's like a it's like a Tarantino movie when someone gets shot, they right. just explode with a fountain of blood. So yeah. Billy sees this bloody lump being loaded into the back of an ambulance and asks the pertinent question of is he dead? To which they do not answer. No. They just look at him. I think one of them is even chewing gum. Yeah. And they just, they kind of like smirk at him and then just leave. Worse than the paramedics and Hot Rod. Yes. <laughs> Maybe my favorite extras in a movie of all time. <laughs> um, okay. So does he go to the party now or yes. does he go and tell his family? I can't remember. Yeah. This is where he, this is where he goes. Oh yeah. He does tell the family. They don't care. And then he goes to the party anyway. Oh, I love that. He tells his family. He's like, uh, David's dead. And they're like, Oh, anyway, that sucks. <laughs> and even the, the sister is like, Oh, well, you know, it is what it is. And he goes, oh, right. Cause they, the family gives him the telegram mm-hmm. where he's been invited to the party. And they're like, isn't this great? That's right. It's a telegram, which I think even Ted Ferguson said as a joke. I was like, yeah, Oh, I'll send, I'll send you a telegram. 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 yeah but then he does <laughs> and billy's like distraught about his friend his his potential friend david the the, the, the ex-boyfriend of the sister being dead he's yeah. like and the sister goes what are you gonna wear and he goes to the funeral she goes no to the party <laughs> right <laughs> which i thought was a great line but he goes to this party and he runs into the clarissa girl again right and i didn't i mean i guess it's just to sexually entice him but my favorite part of the scene is she goes oh oh no you're in danger of losing this button on your shirt right. it's only held on by a single thread and then she breaks the button off his shirt and goes oops <laughs> right and i'd be i'd be like are you paying for this shirt <laughs> yeah are you fucking kidding me you just ruined my fucking shirt yeah he also confronts ted and ted just basically says like admits to everything as yeah. we heard in the trailer yeah. yeah he said first i he's at first i dined and then i fucked your sister then everybody <laughs> fucked your sister yeah and then i killed your friend blanchard yeah everybody got so turned on by me fucking your sister that they wanted to fuck your sister and it's like wow there's a lot <laughs> it's a lot to break down there's a lot happening uh-huh and then they throw him in the pool Clarissa cleans him up and says, just come back to my house. It's so funny because the way this scene is cut, Sean and his his cheerleader girlfriend is watching him. Yeah. It, there's no real like POV shot or anything. It just cuts to her in the car with her best friend with like binoculars. I can't believe it. Yeah. And like there's the way the, the, the composition and the framing of the shots are that cutting back and forth. It's like she's. Like, the car is parked next to the pool. It's not, like, across the street or anything. Yeah, it's so confusing. And then also, on top of that, in the previous scene, his girlfriend broke up with him. Yeah. She said, I think we should start seeing other people. So, I don't know. (laughs) But then there's this sex scene between Clarissa and David. Yeah. And this is where we get... The greatest line of the movie. Mean machine, jelly bean. (laughs) Which, you would think there's some context to that noise. There is not. No. She just says that as they're getting undressed. There's a few lines like that because 
they start to they start to get hot and heavy Mm -hmm. and her body moves in a weird way like she's as we see in the trailer her legs are pointing a different direction from the rest of her body right and he tells her you were in a funny position Mm -hmm. and her response is oh billy you're so sweet yeah i wonder when exactly you lost your virginity yep Yep. And then immediately cut to her making him tea. Making him tea and says, how do you like your tea? Uh, with cream sugar? Or would you like me to pee in it? Yeah. And Billy goes, what? You're a class act, Clarissa. Yeah, you're a class act. And we just gloss right over that line. Yeah. What? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> if a girl asks me that, the date's over. Yeah. I'm like, I think I should go home. I think. I think I should go home. <laughs> I think I, I, you know what? I'd like my tea to go, please. <laughs> I like all of my bodily organs exactly in the place where they currently are. Uh-huh. Like, I know. And this is even before her mom comes home and coughs up hair. <laughs> we get introduced to the mob, and my note is just, why is Miss Carolyn acting like Bubba from Texas Chainsaw? Oh, I, my God. It's never explained. No. She's just kind of like, oh, oh. Yeah, and I'm like, and- she's part of the high society? <laughs> but she's not, because she helps him out later in the movie. Like, yeah. I don't. I don't know, because Clarissa is clearly part of it, and she she's a turncoat later on, uh-huh. which you would think then the mom is a part of it, but she helps out Milo at the end. Just on the on the, the promise of getting some yummy hair to eat. Yeah, gotta eat that hair. <laughs> gotta eat that hair. And so, Billy leaves, he sums up, somehow ends up in the woods and finds the dead body of the guy he was debating, the nerd, uh-huh. and then we get another assembly scene where he tries to confront the entire school, and he's like, hey, I, I saw so-and-so, the guy's name, I can't remember who his name is, but I saw him dead in the woods yeah. last night, and then- that guy just shows up on stage like, what I miss? What's going on here? I actually do love, there's a couple of bits here that are very funny because mm-hmm. the kid the kid shows up, Martin, and he, because he's like, I saw him in the woods, his throat was slit, and he shows up and he's like rubbing at his neck yeah. like while <laughs> while our, our Billy storms off. He also enters the scene like it is the room. Like he just kind of walks in out of frame from the left of the screen. <laughs> oh, hi, Billy. Yeah. Oh, hi, Billy. What I miss? And then the whole school just laughs at him. Laughs at him. And that that's the end of that scene as well. Yep. Yeah, we just move on. Oh, we we also missed the like Blanchard's funeral yes. where the body appears to be like a dummy that's yes. like made out of porcelain. We should mention Blanchard's got a very specific beauty mark yes. on his cheek. And Milo and Billy go to the funeral and I think it's Milo touches Billy's cheek and it like caves in on itself. Yeah, you know how you do when you poke the body at yeah. the open casket. Here's the other thing, if they want to hide that Blanchard it's not really dead. Mm-hmm. Closed casket. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, especially with the wreckage from the car crash we saw earlier. Like, that would make sense. Right. But it is funny because Milo convinces himself. He goes, oh, they probably had to do a lot of reconstruction yeah. from the damage from the car wreck. Right. Like, that's that's Brian Hughes' way of explaining that away, I feel like. This is where Milo finally cops to. So, throughout the movie, Billy keeps finding weird shit in his car. There's oh like a God, candle yes. with a screw yes. in it. He finds a shrunken head in his locker. He finds a sex stall in his car and uh-huh. then milo just says like i did it yeah but wait, why yeah <laughs> he's like i wouldn't have done it if i known you would take it this extremely yeah it comes to nothing yeah no it does it's just there to get more creepy weird shit during the movie right yeah. and then billy uh, i guess sort of has an intervention with his family yes where he is drugged and taken to the hospital he's drugged by his therapist who right. continuously says throughout the movie you know i don't I hate like giving you drugs, drugs. yeah <laughs> he's taken to a hospital where it, in the like the entryway it looks like a saved by the bell set like it's it sure the most does. kaleidoscopic design i've ever seen and it, it's so funny because he goes to the hospital and then milo goes who is trying to find him yeah and we saw this in the trailer he goes to a nurse he's like i'm looking oh for billy whitney and she goes uh oh, he's down in the morgue yeah you have to and go to the goes, morgue no 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 <laughs> <laughs> but it's also th- this is the most circuitous part of the plan mm-hmm. because billy wakes up in the hospital and decides to go back home yeah and then they're just like yeah that was perfect he's clearly on some kind of drug to like make him loopy because milo and clarissa who at this point we don't really know what her motivation is right. but they're both like hey don't go back home don't go home that's clearly they have a trap set for you and he's like oh milo and then he just drives home <laughs> milo says can't you see they're setting you up for something yeah and his response is paranoid yeah. i'm not paranoid which is like, he says no. later earlier to the therapist i've never been paranoid <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and he shouts it at him <laughs> that's a really funny line and so he does go home and he gets a knife and this is where he can, tries to confront his family and he gets attacked by uh the police officer that he saw 
earlier in the movie right. and one of the uh, paramedics and they put like this animal control dog collar around him which yeah. I thought was great yeah they like leash him up yeah and they they, they basically corner him and, and bring him into the living room and then everybody basically you've seen in this movie is there yeah it's Judge Carter who we've heard about and haven't seen yet it's Ted Ferguson it's the extra with the wild fucking hair <laughs> it's everybody's pretty much there except Milo Clarissa the mom of Clarissa and, and David and Judge Carter comes down and tells Billy's parents is like this is this was so effective so efficient in bringing him to the party and really? I'm just like right because like if you if you drugged him earlier then just put him in a room till the party happens you don't have to go through the extra steps even all that you don't have to do all this weird shit throughout the movie like right. you could just if the plan is to shunt him at this house yeah it's his house you don't even have to trick him to get there just lock him in a room not even that just act normal or, or yeah okay <laughs> sure i don't know it's very convoluted just yeah what's the most efficient version of this <laughs> yeah yeah the therapist says everyone played their parts beautifully i'm like really clarissa didn't have to ask him if he needed piss in his coffee <laughs> <laughs> whatever right i don't know it's bizarre but this is this is where we, we we don't really get an explanation for what they are billy right. insists that they're aliens and they're like no we're not we're just we've been around for a long time he says it twice i know he says he says alien scum and then he's like oh we're not alien invaders we've been around as long as you have we're from earth and he then he yells alien, alien scum, scum again, again. Because <laughs> he's not listening <laughs> And so this is the, the the last act of the movie. This is what you paid the ticket for. This is they flip on the malignant lights. They sure they. Um, it's so funny how immediately they switch the lighting. Like it's not even subtle. They uh -uh. just flip a switch uh -huh. and it's giallo lighting. But this is why I think maybe Ari Aster or David Cronenberg love this movie. Oh yeah, because this is where the shunting begins. <laughs> and so they tell Billy, "You're not the only one. The, the only guest we have tonight. There is another." And then they bring in this kid with a, 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 a pillowcase over his head. Uh -huh. And they're like, this is also going to be a part of the party. And they rip off the pillowcase and it's David Blanchard, the kid they, they thought had died in the car accident. Right. And the judge says maybe one of the best lines in this movie, which is, I do love the smell of the hunt and, and the, the taste, taste of, of the, the shunt. shunt. And before the shunting begins, the therapist is just groping the sister in front of the mother. Oh, and yeah. I'm just like, ew, 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 yeah. ew, ew. Because <laughs> they're all old men. They all have the the horseshoe mullet that's just like no hair on top, and it's all on the side. It's, yeah. it's gross. It's the Homer Simpson special. Yes. And then, man... Ugh. The shunting, it, w what's wild about it is it starts, when it kicks off, it looks like, oh, they're cannibals, which yes. like the original screenplay, they were like a blood cult. Yes. And Brian Yosna was like, well, that's not weird enough. Yeah. And so they kind of chew on this kid for a little while until you realize... Oh, someone's hand is going into inside his butt cheeks. Yes. Someone else is like putting their finger through his face. And so it's and the yellow lighting switches on and they're telling Billy, you got to watch this. This is going to happen to you next. And so like there's KY jelly everywhere. <laughs> Everyone, it becomes a, a Lovecraftian horror. Like yeah. people's faces start melding into the body of this kid. Yeah. They're, they're mouths elongates they, they're just like be absorbing him and also like torturing Becoming him one body piece yes yeah. exactly yeah they're all kind of melding together and like i said that scene in the 2011 prequel to the thing is a perfect example of what this is yeah, but I then imagine so. like a bunch of people doing that all at once and they're all also moaning and groaning and yeah. smiling and it's very sexual in nature it's 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 a nightmare yes and the judge says a, a real campy line, which is time to get to the bottom of things, shoves his fist off screen into this kid's asshole. <laughs> yep. And emerges out his the kid's mouth. Popping his eyes out. Yes. Yeah. Stretching his head to abnormal links and, and it's just gooey and stretch. It's disgusting. This is where I wrote down, is this our first fisting murder on the show? Hmm. <laughs> I think it has to be, right? I feel like like there's something in cabin in the woods similar to this but i could be wrong or super maybe or super yeah i could see it <laughs> or under the skin oh maybe. yeah probably yeah i don't know this is definitely a first in terms of how they're doing it here though <laughs> sure and i don't know about you but if i'm billy 
And I am seeing all this shit. I faint. I am losing my fucking mind. Yeah. He is. I'm insane. Dead silent. He's gone. He, <laughs> yeah. I am inconsolable. I am pissing out my mouth. I'm <laughs> shitting out my dick. I'm losing my mind. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. No, I, yeah. My life is over. Yeah. I, I might go into cardiac arrest. I don't know. And. Maybe the funniest part of this whole thing is it cuts to the therapist who now With has the camera. <laughs> a full camcorder and is just giggling like a schoolgirl filming this, which I'm also like, don't film that. That's right. photographic evidence. You don't want that. You know, you know better. Yeah. No. And then he, he drops the camera and he's got like Jack Joker Nicholson smile. face. Yeah. Yeah. He, he sure it is like he's got like the smile X on him. Yeah. <laughs> but Clarissa runs in and rescues him and rescues Billy and tells him, I love you. Yeah, which I'm just is. like, wow, that's, that's interesting. This movie has a lot of similarities to like Halloween three with the love story there that is unearned. Oh, sure. And then a lot of like underage sexual innuendos and a lot of body horror like it like, is I, i'll be i'll be the first person to say billy warlock is no tom atkins he is not could you oh man tom atkins should have been like the dad or the therapist or something tom oh. atkins should have played billy and they never acknowledge that he's <laughs> that not he's a high schooler 49 years old <laughs> <laughs> he's drinking beer with his mustache and yeah fuck you butthead <laughs> i know we we try not to recommend uh, movies we've done on the show as pick me ups. I feel like this movie and Halloween three would be a great pairing. Great double feature. Absolutely. Yes. And so Billy manages, like you said, Clarissa comes in and for whatever reason, she's in love with him now, even though she's a part of all this. Right. Uh, and frees him from his collar. He runs upstairs into his parents' bedroom. And this, <laughs> this is, I mean, if you thought the shunting was bad, this is wacky, wild because the mom has like these giant Sasquatch legs out of nowhere. And man hands. And man hands. And under her dress, the sister's head pops out where the mom's crotch would be. And this is the one effect that is clearly like a mannequin yes. and a and a stop motion bit, but it still works because the whole thing feels like a weird spook house carnival ride at this point. It is unsettling as hell. And then the dad, <laughs> whose face is literally, literally protruding, protruding out of his own asshole. <laughs> and we forgot to mention, he says, w before you said the line, <laughs> we forgot to mention earlier, Billy confronts his parents when he's at the peak of his paranoia and goes, Something like, uh, he says something to his mom, and the dad goes, don't you talk to your mother that way? And he goes, oh, my mother, God knows where my real mother is. Right. The dad gets, like, kind of huffy and puffy, and then he goes, fuck you, butthead. Right. And then the dad in this moment, who is literally a butthead, says, well, son, I guess you're right. I am a butthead. And then he keeps making little... <laughs> farting sounds with his mouth. It's so stupid. Yeah, he goes, he's making raspberries. He's going... And he he cackles like the Joker. He like, does. It, it it is so ridiculous, dude. It is so bizarre. You know who would fit in perfectly with this What's in that? a movie we have to do on this show? The fucking camp, the head of the camp counselor from Sleepaway Camp. Oh like, my gosh, he would fit in perfectly with all this shit. Uh, yeah, that that movie. Uh, that movie is <laughs> wild. Uh, I, there, I could talk so much about the weird acting choices in that movie. We got to do Sleepaway Camp at some point yeah. because that movie has, without question, no competition, the worst line of dialogue I've ever heard. Really? Not just like, oh, that's a bad line, uh -oh. but what the person says. Yeah. I don't want to give it away. Right. But when we do Sleepaway Camp- We can cut it, but is it is it the- Line. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It yeah, sure yeah, yeah. fuck it is. I fucking hate that so much. James Earl Jones's dad fucking like, oh buddy. It just Ugh. laughs. I'm like, that is the worst thing I've Yikes. ever heard. In my yeah, life. I don't I, <laughs> and that guy's performance is buck wild. Ooh, I'm getting lightheaded thinking about it. Jesus Christ. <laughs> anyway. No, then yeah, so Milo, meanwhile, has gotten into the party and sees the flesh carnival. Mm -hmm. And he's also a very subdued reaction. We gotta talk about how how he gets into the party. Oh, so he, sure. he teams up with Miss Carolyn, the Leatherface mom. <laughs> sure. He dons a police officer's costume, sneaks into the party, sees all what's happening, and is again, like you said, he's he's kind of like, well, that's odd. Yeah. I, I do love the we can tell which of these 
protrusions is the judge mm-hmm. because he still has a cigar like sticking out of one of the holes. Yes, he's chomping on a cigar the whole time. In the background, the what used to be Blanchard's face, they're pouring champagne down its throat. Yes. Like, there's some wild like sight gags in here. There, there's like a hot tub too that after the shunting of David, they all kind of they're all monstrosities, just yeah. monsters. They dip in this pool and they come back out in their normal again. Right. And they're like, all right, we're going to shunt Billy now. And he has this fist fight with Ted Ferguson, who's his rival of the movie. Ted says, because he, he's he's going to try to save Clarissa. And Ted goes, you're going to rescue the maiden? And, he, and Billy goes, something like that. Yeah. And I was like, this guy doesn't even know what's happening anymore. No. Our hero. And so he starts to like try to merge faces with Billy. Uh-huh. And <laughs> this is the greatest scene in this movie. Nuts. Billy, he saw what happened to David with the, the judge ramming his arm through David's ass out. Out his mouth sure and decides he's gonna do that mid shunt to ted he so he 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 punches <laughs> i don't even know where he punches ted at exactly in the belly button i think i think what, you're right what's interesting is that this fight is before the fight begins ted is referred to as the champion of the shunt yes. and i i gotta know what he had to do to be called the champion you're right and before all that too the the judge is taking a liking to him he says we could use a guy like you in washington oh, i yeah. think there's an internship for you in washington or whatever oh yeah right there's like a lot of implications that this this society has permeated all of culture yes of all of the elitists right like all the politicians and the the rich and all things like that and so billy punches ted mid shunt and <laughs> the sound effect <laughs> is like a looney tunes effect <laughs> exactly <laughs> like he like ted kind of looks like howard the duck during the scene <laughs> yeah and collapses in on himself like his face caves in his stomach rolls up we see we see billy's finger pop out of ted's mouth right his other fingers pop out of ted's eyes and he grabs th- th- you guys have to see this yeah, like this can't, is we impossible can't describe to describe it. yeah but he grabs ted by the face from the inside and turns him inside out yeah he turns him inside out and kills him and you hear you hear someone in the background looking at ted's corpse yell don't touch him until he's congealed yes yeah <laughs> which which implies that maybe he survived maybe i guess but clarissa and Milo are like come on billy let's get out of here and they run out of the party they manage to get out hop in billy's jeep and drive away and like that's like the end of the movie <laughs> yeah there's a l- one last little gag where the judge that looks at ted's body and says like i guess now we got another opening in washington or yeah. something like that yeah just fucking roll credits. It's, yeah. It is an abrupt ending. It's it. This is like the season of abrupt endings, I it feel is. like. Th- there was actually a comic book sequel that right? I can't find. Right. It was apparently released alongside the, the Blu-ray when Arrow Video first put it out, yeah. but uh, it did not come with my copy, sadly. Yeah, I think it was called like Society 2 Blood Party or something Party like that. Party Monster. Some- Party Monster, yeah. Yeah. And I'll say this. Um... <laughs> I had heard a lot about the shunting over the years and about this movie in general. Yeah. And now having finally seen it, I gotta say, the hype is real. Yeah. Like, it's one of the few, like, this movie's gonna fucking blow your mind. Like, that actually does do what it says. Right? Like, it's just... I, I don't know. It's it's indescribable. Like yeah. we cannot describe what happened. I'm sure you could go on YouTube and just search the society shunting and find it. Right. But it is a lot. It's a lot. It's unique. It is disgusting. Yeah. It is wild. It is scary as hell. <laughs> but I couldn't help but think when the credits started rolling, why is this movie more highly regarded than something like Basket Case? Right. Is it because there's more of a plot here? I think so. And I think, I think there, you know, for all, as silly as this movie is, I think there is more artistry to this than, than Basket Case. Yeah. Which I will put my foot down. <laughs> we will never do Basket Case 2 or 3. Really? I, we okay. cannot. I'll, I may do the first one. I refuse to do the third one on principle alone. <laughs> really? I've never seen either of the sequels. I've seen... I know what they're about. And okay. I'm like, no fucking way we're doing okay. the show. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. So, is there anything else to talk about with just the overall plot and the ending of society before we wrap up stuff here. Uh, I just, I lo- since you mentioned the beauty mark earlier, I do love whenever they unshunt right. the, uh, the judge now has Blanchard's beauty mark on his face. Mm-hmm. And it seems very stoked about it too. Yeah, he loves it. Yeah. Um. Okay. 
I think that's <laughs> I, it, it feels anticlimactic, but that really is the end of the movie. It is. Yeah. And uh yeah, there's Go out on a high. <laughs> yeah. Um, so why don't we talk about prop cop? So if this is your first time tuning into the show, we do a bunch of little segments here at the end of the show where we talk about things such as prop cop, which is where we look at all of the props in the movie of the week, in this case, society, and each of us pick one prop from the movie that we would love to own for ourselves. Yeah. Uh, It can be anything physical, anything tangible. So Nathan, this is your pick. Yeah. What prop would you like from society? Uh, When Billy and Clarissa go to uh, check the wreckage of the car in the woods, Mm -hmm. uh, Clarissa is where this dope ass bedazzled like fringe denim jacket Mm -hmm, i want mm -hmm. it more than anything (laughs) okay uh i want the little ken doll that billy (laughs) finds in his jeep with the screw in its head yeah i I thought that was fun looks like something (laughs) sid would make in toy story it sure does it sure does okay so now we'll move on to bit part which is where we look at all of the extras in this movie, all of the preferably non-named characters, right. and we recast them as ourselves to build our filmography. I want to be Turd Ferguson's buddy <laughs> that is at the party, that I think is at the beach as well, but uh-huh. he's in a full suit, yes, lying on the ground next to a jacuzzi, drinking with the two girls in the hot tub. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> this guy looks like he belongs in a Talking Heads music video. Like <laughs> I, I love that he has a no lines yeah. and I, I loved him dearly so that's my bit part nathan who do you want to be i also want to be in that entourage i want to be the punk girl with the teased out hair yes during <laughs> what's so wild is so at the beginning of the party at the end of the movie right. she has her hair like out in like four triangles yes. she looks like tommy's mom from rugrats <laughs> uh-huh she sure fucking does and then later on in the party it's more like a bouffant kind of thing like she she's restyling as the party goes she, she is a featured extra in that she is featured prominently throughout these scenes she doesn't uh-huh. have any lines but you will see her in the background of every absolutely she's, she's at the school assembly too you see her like they they made sure this girl stuck out she's so, a hero uh, mm-hmm. and I, I i gotta also toss it out to another a couple of extras that I was obsessed with and Please. that shot you're talking about where the shunting ends and we see like a procession of people standing up and getting out of the, the room yeah there are there's a couple in the background just having a quiet conversation mm-hmm. and I'm like what what in the world could they be talking about that is like more engrossing than the shunting I have no clue I have no idea who do you think would win in a fight the shining or the shunting <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the shining because it could see the shunting coming I was gonna say that's a rhetorical question you don't necessarily have to answer if you if you did have an opinion no I, I had one all right well let us uh tarry no further <laughs> and we will talk about the silver lining of 1989's society so what is the silver lining to this movie Nathan uh Billy knows he's not crazy yeah that is one way to know that you're not <laughs> paranoid. You are justified. He's probably crazy after this. Oh, yeah. He needs a lot of therapy. This, he's done. Yeah. One of my least favorite tropes in a movie is when a character survives a horror movie and in the next movie they're put in an insane asylum. Right. Which uh, we'll kind of be talking about next week, too. But <laughs> I feel like sure. Billy is justified yeah. in going to one. <laughs> yeah, he's done. He's cooked. You cannot explain the shunting to a layperson. Like, you just can't. <laughs> sure. Especially if it was real. Yeah, absolutely. My silver lining is that someone like Turd Ferguson won't end up in Washington. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, we we are spared one more uh, awful politician or lobbyist or CEO. We're spared that. So Absolutely. I also was genuinely shocked Milo made it out of this movie alive. Me too. Yeah. I was going to ask, like, should we even do a best kill? There's only two. Right. Right? And It's got to be Ted, right? <laughs> well, I was going to say they're both great. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know. David's death is insane yeah it is it's it's watching a full human man-sized fist (laughs) emerge from the mouth of a kid yeah and grip their face and pull it in proportions that do not exist in society or in society (laughs) in in the real world right like it is a sight to be i'll say this if you've never seen this movie, uh-huh. even after having described it up to this point, it is still worth seeing at least once. Yep. Like, I'll go ahead and get into my recommendation now. I, I think you got to see it at least once, if nothing else, but for the last 20 minutes. Yeah, I agree. I do feel like, and maybe this is sacrilegious, I do feel like this movie is ripe for a remake. Interesting. And I say that because in its current state, it's just too all over the place. Yeah. Like, 
at times it's a cheesy 80s slasher type movie like a chopping mall or something like that uh-huh. other times it's a full-on body horror film like video drone and other times it's a black comedy and i think if you just stick to one tone specifically uh-huh. this movie would hit hard like yeah, i wonder if a, if a new one would feel quite as like because i feel like some of the kookiness is what sells this movie yeah and i i feel like it, it, it it's so specifically 80s I, i'm not saying you can't do any of the black comedy yeah but stick to the horror aspects yeah. of this stuff i'd be curious for sure to see a remake so i started thinking last night about like who would be a great director working today that could take this over yeah. and i think i've mentioned the obvious ones like ari aster and david cronenberg but also brandon cronenberg sure i think could really do this fede alvarez fede alvarez i was also thinking about uh julia de Corneau, who did oh, sure. Titan. yeah yeah i think that would be really interesting and if we really want to get into the the black comedy of it <laughs> fucking make james wan do this oh with, my uh, god can you imagine his writing partner from malignant yeah akila cooper yeah. yeah that would be that would be something i'm into that yes put megan in there oh let my megan God. fight the shunting <laughs> it's like uh the end of split and megan shows up at a bar with billy <laughs> and she's like i knew some crazy shit that happened once too no i i really do think like after especially seeing that one scene and talk to me i'm like i would love to see society's shunting remade today like okay. boy that would be awesome i gotta see that movie you do um what about this at, at the end of every movie we cover on the show yeah. we always offer a pairing for the movie of the week in this case society what's yeah. a movie that pairs well with society well there's a there's another movie that i kept thinking about about a jock who dates a girl of a different social standing who's not quite who she appears to be oh, and boy. Uh, i would say she's all that oh wow a great follow-up to this movie okay uh, I've already mentioned it before on the show a couple of times, but I think you got to watch Chopping Mall right after this. Hell yeah. That movie is equally as dumb. Yeah. Equally as goofy, equally as low budget. And I would say equally as memorable. Yeah. Because that movie is also batshit fucking crazy. And I think you would get a lot of enjoyment out of watching those back to back. So and that movie has Dick Miller and Barbara Crampton. Mm-hmm. So it automatically gets like five extra points. Mm-hmm. And uh, the couple from uh, Eating Raul. That's right. Yes. That's right. At the beginning of that movie too. Yeah. Chopping Mall is a wild fucking movie. I love it. I love it so much. It's so ridiculous. 75 minutes soaking wet. Like, I would love like- to do it on the show, but I don't, I don't know if it qualifies. Qualifies. It can, doesn't. Uh, it has a very triumphant ending. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. So, do you recommend Society? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I, I think it is worth a watch at least once. It's not for the squeamish, mm-hmm. but, oh, no. uh, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend watching it during dinner like <laughs> I did. Uh, <laughs> uh-huh. But uh, it's it's definitely worth a watch. Yeah. If, you, if you're a fan of Cronenberg at all, you'll be a fan of this. Oh, yeah. For sure. Well, that is Society from 1989. Listener, if you want to get more of our show, check out everywhere you get podcasts. You can find our show, The Several Lines Playlist. Uh, If you haven't already, please subscribe, rate, and leave some feedback for us. We'd really appreciate that. And if you just can't get enough of our show and you want to watch some clips or see some uh, occasional behind-the-scenes photos and videos, you can check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Just search for the Silver Linings playlist. I'm sure you'll find us. And you can also check out our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash silver linings playlist. Now, we are officially halfway through, or over halfway through now at this point, through Spooky Linings 2023. Can you believe it? I know, I'm sad it's almost over already, but we got two more to go. But next week, we are finally getting into a franchise proper that somehow, (laughs) 160 episodes in, we have yet to talk about. And uh, this one may be divisive. Really? I feel like people that like this movie really like it, but I feel like people that really like uh, the source material for this movie prefer that one. Okay. But either way, I got a clue for what we're talking about next week. And that clue is get ready for prime time, bitch. Oh, bitch. I'm so excited. <laughs> Bitch, I cannot wait to talk about next week's movie. <laughs> so, uh, you've got plenty of hints throughout this episode of what we're talking about next week. That's so, right. return to us next week for the first time we're talking about this franchise properly. I'll say that. Yeah. We have dipped our toes in there, but not fully. This time we're fully getting in there. So, be ready, bitch. <laughs> Nathan, any final words before we get out of here for this week? No, man, I think that we have uh, had a very... This is such an... I was kind of dreading this conversation because (laughs) it is such a difficult movie to describe. Sure. And I think the fact that this episode kind of maybe sounds like we're having a fever dream is exactly (laughs) correct. 
Yeah. No, I think this is the perfect time to talk about this movie. It, it was great. Totally. It was great. Okay. Return to us next week when we're talking about getting ready for primetime, bitch. That's right. And RIP Oatmeal and I guess David Blanchard. Yeah. No RIP to Turd Ferguson, I'll say. Absolutely not. Not, not at all. And uh, as always, I think I'm adopted. Lean machine, jelly bean. <laughs> Machine jelly bean. Yeah. <laughs> Add it to the soundboard. <laughs> Excelsior. 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 Oh. Look it up. Oh. Machine jelly bean. up another fantastic episode of the Silver Linings Playlist. If you would be so kind, we ask that you leave us some feedback on how we did, plus a like and subscribe. We'll be back next week with another great episode. See ya! 